Once again, my name is Sarah Lipsy uh, from the Mount Rainier Green Team. Welcome to the Native Plant Network uh, kickoff meeting. I'm really excited to have you all here and I am going to hand it over to Luke Chusick to get us started. Luke, over to you. All right, thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick, so hang with me. And you should see my Google slide. And I'm gonna minimize you guys so I can see my screen and I'm gonna present. All right, so hopefully everybody sees my screen. Okay, well, again, like Sarah said, wanna thank everybody for joining us here today to talk about the Native Plant Network. I'm gonna take some time just to start here to orient folks to the idea it's really a big picture idea with a community focus, or as the slide says, a community effort with big picture dreams. Um, after I talk for a short time about the network itself, I'm gonna hand it over to our in-house in experts to walk you through the importance and the fun of Planting Native. And then if you have any questions, we just ask that you save them until the end. We've set aside some time from Q&A, so I'll get through my little spiel here. We'll, we'll hand it over to folks and then we'll do Q&A. Uh, at the end of everything. So we appreciate folks holding on to their questions until the end. Okay, so all said, let me first orient you a bit to the problem we're facing. So we are facing a crisis in biodiversity loss around the planet right now. Most of that is due to a loss in native habitat, especially in the loss of forest coverage. And unfortunately, most of the forests we have preserved, so these are our state parks, our national parks, they act as kind of little islands of preserves. Uh, so that according you know, to this quote here, 70% of our forests are within just one kilometer of a forest edge. Okay, why is that bad? Well, biodiversity, that's the bugs, the birds, the bees, the bears, everything in between, including us, um, really decline the closer you get to a forest edge. And unfortunately, most of our forests are near a forest edge. So that's the problem. So what can we do about it? Well, when I first thought big picture about this problem, I came up with this like grand scheme. I thought, hey, you know what? We could connect all these national and state parks with native plant corridors along our waterways. We could put a bunch of 18 to 26 year olds to work, do a giant national service project, uprooting invasive species, planting native species, and we'll call it the new, new deal. It'll be this great thing. And it'll be this huge dream to address this big problem. Um, so that was my first idea. Um, but alas, there are some problems with this idea. Um, most of all is that fixing this problem nationwide is not within my circle of control. Um, and that's where I've got to give Mr. Money Mustache, an online blogger, some credit for sort of refocusing my mind at what I can control. And here's right around this time, just a quote that, that he had written in one of his blogs and reviewing a book. And what he said is, is, you will have a much better life if you focus your mental and physical energy only on the things you can personally influence. Everything else is a distraction that pulls you away from running your life properly. But quite counterintuitively, this smaller focus does not shrink your influence and your ability to do good. It causes these things to increase. And that's where I came up with the idea for the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network. So maybe just by focusing on our circle of control, we can start a movement right here to connect communities to one another through a native plant network. As I said on that first slide, our existing forests are not enough. We need to turn our yards back into enough of the native habitats they once were to create the ecosystem, the bugs and the birds and the bees, all those guys need to survive. We need our yards to be the places that help connect our forest preserves to one another. Okay. So what is the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network? At its core, it's an effort to educate residents on the importance of planting native. So that's what we're doing here today, help them figure out how to get started. We're gonna talk a lot about that today. 
and how to incentive folks to do incentivize folks to do so, which we'll we'll talk a little bit about. The end goal, like I said in the last slide, it's really to create native plant habitats through our yards that promote healthy biodiversity across our city and serve as a model for neighboring cities to jump on board. I just want to pause right there because you know sometimes when it comes to what's happening around the planet today, I like you know, maybe a lot of you can get overwhelmed by the weight of the environmental crises that are really all around us. It leads me to worrying about what kind of future I'm gonna leave my kids, um, other sorts of depressive thoughts like that. It's a lot to ponder. Um, but our effort here, this effort to focus on our circle of control by reversing biodiversity decline just in our little square mile of earth, it helps us take that mental energy and refocus it on our circle of control. You know, not only is that better for our mental health, but maybe, you know, just maybe if we do it right here, others will follow suit. And so that dream I laid out in that slide about connecting the national forests, you know, it won't seem so ridiculous if other folks start following suit with what we're doing here in Mount Rainier. So like Mr. Money Mustache says, quite counterintuitively, this smaller focus on our community isn't gonna shrink our influence and ability to do good it's gonna cause those things to increase. So getting back to the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network, the goal, like we said, is to get you planting native on your property. And if you can reach any one of these three tiers, so there are three tiers to becoming a member in the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network, um, you can have 10% of your non-structured landscape devoted to native plants. You can have 50% of your non-structured land of, uh, uh, landscape devoted to native plants, which would make you an urban forest member, or you can be a biodiversity member with, with just 25 different native plants in your landscape. If you reach any one of those three tiers, we will incorporate you officially into the network, which will entitle you to, if you want it, a, a really neat small circle yard sign um, designed by a local artist that says your yard is a part of the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network. And then we will get you a special designation on an online map that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later. Our plan is to use this spring and summer to educate residents like what we're doing here today, to personally assist you in getting started in your efforts. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then to certify yards in the fall that meet one of these requirements and continue that process then on an annual basis. I'm not gonna get into the certification piece today. We're gonna to focus more on the education front um, so what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Barry and Kathy. They're going to focus more on why this matters so much and how awesome native planting can be. Um, then we'll get into how you can, how we can, how we can help you start the process of planting native, get to that map I referenced earlier, and then end with that Q&A session. So just again, if you can save your questions until the end, we would appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to take stop share and turn it over to Barry and Kathy. Um, okay, and I am going to share <clears throat> and, and welcome you. This is Kathy Schellenberger. My husband, Barry Stahl, and I are going to talk to you about the importance of the kind of plant, native plant network that we've just described. We are Mount Rainier residents, very excited to see this kind of work taking off in our own community. So what's the problem? Luke's talked a, a little bit about this already. Let's take a little poll. So the question is, to what extent do you feel habitat loss contributes to our environmental woes? Let us know. We're gonna see our answers in just a minute. I hope. There they come. Okay. Seems like people won't need a whole lot of convincing 
that habitat loss is important. In fact, research indicates that the loss of wildlife habitat is threatening our ecosystem health profoundly. Much of this research is focused on bird decline because birds are easier to count than some other types of um, species. So that's where we'll start. A little side note, which echoes what Luke said. This can be depressing, but it's a bad news, good news story. And we will get to the good news, so bear with me. This is a wood thrush, fairly common in our area. It winters in Costa Rica and therefore has to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. Do you see where you are? I'm gonna help with a little overlay that should make it even clearer. So once upon a time, about a hundred years ago, our thrush saw this on our part of its journey. Lots of places to stop, rest, and refuel. This is a flight, by the way, that the thrush takes in one night. Nowadays, it looks like this, very different picture, much less forested with habitat that's been fragmented, degraded, and in some cases removed. This makes finding those places to stop along the way a lot tougher for our thrush. And to make it worse, here we see lights at night. Most birds migrate at night and they're lured towards cities, distracted and disoriented by lights. They circle until they're exhausted and need a place to land. Hopefully our wood thrush finds a place like this, a little oasis of the kind of habitat we're looking to create. It doesn't look good though. I'm sorry, somehow I muted myself, I guess. Um, it doesn't look good though. Wood thrush population is declining by, as you can see on this graph, about 2% a year. We're gonna look at our thrush as a bioindicator because its decline and bird decline in general is a harbinger of wider environmental woes. Much of what we know about the demise of habitat and the problem it spells for the planet comes from the work of Douglas Tallamy, professor of entomology at University of Delaware. He lays out the vision that he has probably most clearly in his latest book entitled Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. He starts with the bad news and it's bad. 95% of the country developed, log drained, grazed, tilled, paved, river straightened, some no longer reach the sea. Polluted air, aquifers dry, native plant communities that have been decimated by imports and a natural world, which as Luke described, is carved into tiny remnants. So how did we get here? What's the cause? He picks out three major causes. The first being the kind of development our thrush sees now. It has to fly over suburban deserts and urban deserts with lots of roofs and pavement and very few landing spots. There's also our love of lawn in America. Lawn provides basically no benefit to wildlife and it seems to have become part of the American dream. Starting the 1700s, status has been defined by imports from Europe, both expansive lawns and exotic plants, and we're still pretty much there. The third cause that Talamy picks out is our increasing use of monoculture as our primary form of agriculture, which means basically in parts of our country, one crop for miles and miles as far as the eye can see, the polar opposite of biodiversity. So that's the bad news and how we got here. Barry gets to deliver the good news. So what's the solution? The good news, indeed, is that the solution is us. <laughs> We're back to Talamy again, who's painted the picture of how dire it is but he also has some really good solutions. 
He refers to a homegrown national park. As Luke was saying, we really can't connect all the national parks. And even if we did, it wouldn't be enough land to restore habitat. What he says, as it says in this quote, is what if each American landowner made it a goal to convert half of his or her lawn to productive plant communities? Even moderate success could collectively restore some semblance of ecosystem function to more than 20 million acres of what is now ecological Westland. Mm -hmm. So our goal right here in Mount Rainier is to create a wildlife network using the spaces over which we have control. And it is kind of revolutionary because we have control over what happens. Here's another shot. This is the Atlantic Flyway. This is where the birds migrate. And it's a third of the population lives in this part of the world, our part of the world. Right here in Mount Rainier, we have about 20 acres that's, um, that's covered in lawn and it's providing no benefit and really no place for that thrush to land. So where is it that we can create wildlife habitat? Well, we have our backyards, our own backyards, and in many cases, they're blank slates. Most of us have much more lawn than we really need. All we really need is a place to play, a place to socialize, and paths through our property, and the rest of it can all go to a native habitat. Here's an example. Beds, a walkway, and stepping stones, all covered in native plants. Excellent habitat. Another example, a backyard with paths, with patio areas, and lots of beds for putting native plants. We need a place to put the native plants after all. <laughs> but we're also in a position here in Mount Rainier as elsewhere to have front yards that are nothing but little patches of grass. They can be turned into gardens like this. A small patch that's now a grass patch can be a excellent native habitat. <laughs> or in this case, a shady spot that's in the front of the house and likewise create, creates a habitat of a different sort. Mm -hmm. And here, all of the above, patio, pathway, doorway, and cheerful black-eyed Susans to lead the eye from the street to the house. Mm -hmm. We also have side yards that are not being used. In some cases, those are between our houses and our neighbor's house, and there's an opportunity to collaborate with them and put something in together. Or if we want to stay on our own property, a little bit of side yard along the house is enough to create a habitat. We have patio, some of us, and some of them are, for lack of a better word, dead spaces. There's no place for that thrush to land here. There's no place for any wildlife to get anything out of this patio. But here, you still have patio space, but it's integrated with plants. You're surrounded by plants when you're sitting in your yard. It's teeming with life. But some of us are not gardeners. Some of us have no time, no energy, little budget, and that's okay because no space is too small. Every space can be used to expand habitat. Even a deck like this, <laughs> where there's little else around, all of a sudden, the thrush can look down and find a place to land. Even a windowsill like this is habitat. <laughs> so how do we go about creating wildlife habitat? Well, the underlying principle is to make like mother nature. Mother nature, has all the principles that are needed to create a good wildlife habitat. They involve replacing your lawn, replacing introduced plants, replacing invasive plants with native trees, shrubs, and perennials. Natives are extremely valuable because 90% of the uh, insects eat plants and uh, bees also, and they specialize. 
They don't all eat every kind of plant like the um, caterpillar that's pictured on this milkweed. They have one plant that they, um, that they can use to eat. And so there's a need for biodiversity in our gardens. There's a need to plant natives because they're the ones that provide benefit. On this slide, for example, you have Nandina, a common plant that we see in many gardens in the area, which is host to zero caterpillars. Blueberry or vaccinium, on the other hand, hosts 294 caterpillars, much, much more beneficial to the birds and other wildlife. Mm -hmm. There are also benefits, not just to the uh, environment, but to us. Uh, native plants are low maintenance. They prevent invasives from uh, coming in and taking over. They provide beauty, diversity, a sense of place, and they attract beneficial wildlife, which eats pesky insects. So you have your own built-in biocontrol. And these are all examples of densely planted landscapes that are full of pollinators. Mm -hmm. So we're asking you to replace your lawn, replace your introduced plants, and plant those that are native and remove those that are invasive or non-native. There are other factors involved in creating habitat, like not using pesticides and fertilizers, but instead relying on things like leaf litter. There's enough leaves on your own property that if you keep them there, you don't have to go out and buy mulch and you're providing food and shelter for wildlife in your garden. Beneficial insects, of course, take care of the harmful insects, as long as you're not spraying and killing off both. Native plant gardens need structure. Mm -hmm. They have all different levels or layers where different plants form niches where they make their nests and where they look for shelter. And the more densely you can plant, the less likely you'll have to do weeding uh, and they'll shade each other out and provide a environment for one another so that they, uh, you have a diversity of plants in your garden. Another aspect of structure is to plant in clearly designated beds. Edging and paths makes for a not only beautiful wildlife garden, but also one that sends a message to your neighbors that says, this is a well-managed place. This is the place where they know what they're doing and maybe inspires others to do the same. You need to provide food for birds, pollinators and other wildlife the major food groups, berries, nuts and seeds, insects and nectar, those are all provided by plants. Bird feeders are good, but they're a supplement. The main food for the wildlife are the plants that you put in your garden. And you wanna leave your plants like the seeds that overwinter for birds to eat on all winter long and to attract other wildlife that are gonna do also good in your garden eating slugs, eating crickets and grasshoppers and things like that, like this toad. Mm -hmm. Shelter and housing are important parts of a native plant network. Leaving dead material as well as growing plants, the decaying matter in your garden is equally important. So include more plant material like this brush pile in a corner that's out of the way and keep your water on site. Every living creature like ourselves needs water and the water is there on your site already. It's a matter of keeping it on your property through rain barrels, through bird baths, through landscaping to keep the water from uh, going into the storm drains. Mm -hmm. And lastly, it's important for a native network to provide safety and safe haven for wildlife. There's no sense to attracting wildlife attracting birds, for example, to your garden, only to see them killed off. So part of native plant planting is um, cutting down on reflectivity on your windows, keeping cats from uh, attacking the birds and other wildlife that you attract to your garden. And now I'll turn it back over to Kathy.
Okay, so this is kind of complicated. At this point, you might be asking, can we do this? Or perhaps more to the point, can I do this? It might be a good time to, to, to do a little temperature taking with another poll question. So this time we'll have the poll open for about 30 seconds. Uh, last time it, people were responding very quickly. Uh, so I'm seeing the answers coming in. And we'll give it uh, another 10 seconds or so. And we'll end the polling here. Okay. It looks like we're more on the exciting than the daunting side, which is really great. But in fact, it can be daunting. So we're going to do a little cheerleading. Can we do this? Yes, we can. It's time. We have to do this. Little by little, yard by yard. We can do this together. It takes time and energy granted, but you can get help. So you might not really know quite where to start. And we're going to start by helping you think about this in steps. It might be that you take a baby step, step, maybe experiment with a side yard like this, or plant a small section elsewhere in your yard, match the time you have, the energy you have with the size and scope of the project, and voila, see what can happen. A gorgeous transformation in a small space. Then you can build on that experience divide and spread the plants that you have in your own garden from one place to another to fill things out. Once you've made some headway in your garden, you can team up with neighbors, divide plants and swap with them. After all, we are building a native plant network. Cost is another thing that can seem daunting, but here again, you can get help. In addition to sharing plants and seeds with neighbors, you can look for free offers. Here's a little list of them, including the Mount Rainier listserv where people tend to list plants that they have extras of and how you can pick them up. You can also apply for rebates like this rain check rebate, which is really worth looking into. It's a good deal. So there are lots of other ways that you can get help to limit costs. Let's say you've got to work on your own property. You're, it's kind of underway and you're wondering what the next step is. You could branch out into public spaces. This is a lovely tree box that someone adopted and turned into a beautiful place. You could look for median strips that have nothing to offer to pollinators and birds and work on those. You could also move out into community spaces, schools, places of worship, or businesses, and can contribute to the transformation of Mount Rainier, our community as a whole. Okay, as you digest all of this, I'd like you to consider this offer. If you're now convinced that creating wildlife habitat on your property is a good idea, but you're still overwhelmed, you feel like you need a jump start. You need help to chunk the task or make a plan or create a vision or you just want some advice. Here's an offer from the Prince George's County Audubon Society. You could request a no cost on site visit with a pair of Prince George's Audubon Society habitat advisors. You can email me to put your name on the list. On the other hand, if you already have wildlife habitat on your property, you can apply for Audubon Wildlife Habitat Certification and get the sign posted here to start neighborhood conversation and give you some National Audubon Society creds. Better yet, you could certify with both the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network and the Audubon Wildlife Habitat Pro Program at the same time. So we're gonna take a look at this New Yorker cartoon. 
Notice that trolls one and two are arguing about their gardens. Troll three is saying the world's falling apart in your gardening. And well, troll three might have a point. There might, be a, there might be bigger things to worry about than wildlife gardening, especially in a time like ours. So why now? Because the time is right, we're on the cusp. Just think about it. It's going to be such an incredible pleasure to watch our surroundings turn from uninteresting blank slates like this to gorgeously, beautifully diverse and interesting feasts for the eye like this. This will be great for pollinators, birds, and other wildlife, but also for us and for our community. Can we do it? Yep, we sure can. Here's to the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. Hi everyone. So you just heard about a few different ways you can get support from the PG County Audubon side. I think you go back one the slide. And um, so I just want to talk to so another opportunity that we have is um, some free pollinator seeds. Um, it's provided through the Anacostia Watershed Society as part of their watershed stewards program, which I was a part of this past fall. And so um, standing up this program is something that I've been helping with as part of my, my class. Um, so there's a bunch of seeds. I have so many seeds at my house. And so we're going to be getting those out. Um, so to, if you're interested, and I think this is actually just in general, if you're interested in the native plant network, we're going to send around a link and I can post it too. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a, a survey or really it's a form. It'll just, you give us the basic information on how to get in touch with you and who you are. Um, and then you can also identify the type of assistance you might need. So that would be uh, gardening consultation and advice from the PG County Audubon Society or uh, native pollinator seeds and soil from the Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, we do have like limited supplies on that. However, I will say there's a lot of supplies at the moment. So I think everybody can participate. Um, and as Luke and others have mentioned, um, we are working also right now on a native plant sign as well. So in the uh, survey, there will be the option to say whether you're interested in a sign. Um, and then down the road after, you know, the spring of summer pass, we'll be looking to certify yards, which will be fun, which I think for me, this whole, you know, I think it can be daunting to do this sort of things, but really just having a good time and having fun and getting to know your neighbors and just enjoying. There's so much pleasure um, in bringing uh, native plants and the native wildlife that follows with it to your yard. So, um, question for the survey. I'm going to put it in the chat. I think the survey question. Um, yeah, that should take you to a Google form link. I think. Um, if not, we'll, we'll also Sarah's going to send it out um, in a while too. So, so that's it for me. Um, look forward to hearing from folks. Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. Or Luke, I'm sorry, back to Luke. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to share my screen again real quick. Oh, I need um, Kathy, maybe you to stop sharing. There we go. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Earlier, I mentioned a map. And what you should see on your screen right now is my Google Chrome and a tab that I have open to a map. And this should be pretty familiar to folks. The yellow line here is Rhode Island Avenue. Um, this is the circle right here where I'm hovering my mouth and this, my mouth, my, <laughs> my mouse, 34th Street coming up here. Um, you see Red Dirt Studio right there. And then you see a couple of blue dots and some little green lines and a green line here. And once you become a member of the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network, you're gonna have an option to put your house on this map. And I'm just gonna zoom in real quick on my home, which is near the community food forest. And what we're trying to do with this map is create a virtual representation of who's a part of the network. Which yards have we turned into that little bit of native habitat that you know Barry and Kathy were showing everybody what could look like. And what happens when you do that is you can click on these little blue bubbles. So I'm gonna click on my home. It says the Chessex, and it's got a little description of what grows well. So you can see what's growing well in my yard. So then when you look at this map, you can see, oh, that's growing well, just a few houses down. 
maybe I can grow that too here. Or you can add anything you want to the comment bubble. Over here, we've got the food forest, Mount Rainier Community Food Forest, talks a little bit about the food forest there. And we've got a green path that is the forest path that we hope to turn into more of a, a native habitat. So over time, as more houses become a part of the network, we're gonna see more of this map turn green with the goal, as I zoom out, of connecting Mount Rainier to this big green thing here, Barnard Hill Park, to eventually get Brentwood on board and connect to the Northwest Branch, which is a greenway that obviously runs along the Northwest Branch and the larger Anacostia River. And that dream I talked about of sort of connecting all these properties all across the country, again, it doesn't become all that crazy sounding because the Sierra Club's Maryland chapter really likes this idea that we've worked on here and that we're, we're, we're getting started up. And they wanna create a native plant and wildlife corridor across the state. And we are working on that right now. And so when I zoom out, You'll already start to see areas of land that we've started designated with the Sierra Club as really good native habitats. Right here is Greenbelt Park. Over here in the middle of DC, you see Rock Creek Park. Along the Potomac River, you see the CNO Canal and all the areas there. And as I zoom out even further, you can see how it's not that hard to connect the Chesapeake Bay over here, the Patuxent River, the research refuge on the Patuxent River, over through even our very urban environments to the CNO Canal, eventually up to the Appalachian Trail. But it starts zooming right back in, right here in Mount Rainier. Pretty cool how focusing on our little circle of control might just have a really big impact on the world. And if you want to get involved on our efforts with the Sierra Club's Maryland chapter, please shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the chat. And then if you want to get on the Mount Rainier Native Plant Network, hopefully you'll want to join. No obligation to put your house on this map, but boy, it'd be really cool if we could start making this community here a lot more green. And that's all I've got, Sarah. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for your presentations, for giving you giving us all of this great information. Um, I'm going to take a look in the chat um, for some of the questions. So I see a question uh, if uh, for Luke, uh, if you could explain what non-structured means talking about the non-structured parts of the yard. Yeah, that's a lawyer trying to come up with a term that just repre represents your yard. <laughs> Basically any part of your yard that doesn't have your house on it or a shed. So, you know, in trying to say, you know, what's 10% of your yard dedicated to native plants, we just came up with the term 10% of your non-structured land. Um, and that's how lawyers can make things more complicated than they need to be. I wanted to throw a question in there. Um, do you all have a favorite native or a native that surprised you that's growing in your garden? I can, t I can say that, um, you know, one of the things that I did in my yard is as I started, I started very small, didn't have a clue what I was doing, started pulling invasive vines that were just crawling over the house. And because I didn't have all the time in the world to just go right into it, I sort of let things stand and native plants started showing up in parts. Um, and, you know, white snake root is one that just started growing and spreading and has gorgeous white blooms in August, September. Um, I've got some native poppies in one area, um, some wild ginger just showed up. Um, so those are three that just sort of popped up and I was surprised that 
didn't have to spend any money. It just sort of um, came about. And then the landscape sort of developed itself. It's not like I had to design anything. All of a sudden it created this place in my yard. Um, so that's for me, I'm sure Barry and Kathy have more experience there. Hey, can I say something, Luke? Yeah. Yeah, go this ahead. Is, this, is, this is Steve on 30th Street. Uh, a second ago, there was a question, I think, asking, uh, do you have a favorite? And because I've heard uh, Barry talk and I've heard Kathy talk, I, uh, and I've heard this Doug Ptolemy guy talk, that they recommend trees as, as doing more bang for the buck than any smaller plant. And in particular, oak trees, because they support uh, uh, butterflies and moths, uh, their babies, their caterpillars, which are very important baby bird food, more than any other plant, um, or, or more than any other tree. And so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I, I think trees and particularly oaks are really good to consider. And I'll jump in and say that there's this really, really, really great plant that just, um, that was, I think Penn State did um, a study on its mountain mint and they found it to be um, just the best um, native for pollinators. We have it in our garden and there are pollinators on it from the very first insect that comes out all the way until the last one that that's around so it's a real pollinator workhorse mm -hmm. and i'll add some others as well <laughs> i think steve is absolutely right about the enormous importance of oak trees and, and other tall canopy trees but i talked about layers so i'm focused right now on a mid-level right now our red buds are in bloom our spice bushes are in the woods in bloom so those are catching my attention. And we've got a red bud right outside our house that has birds on it all the time, pecking away at insects all through the winter and every season of the year. Coming down through, down to ground cover, I have to say there's a lot of good ground covers, wild ginger, our native sedum, but my favorite is pussy does. If you don't know pussy does, Look into it. You will love it. Thanks so much. I see we have a few additional questions and two in particular about sharing some of the information we shared. And so I would just note that this session is being recorded, but we can likely share um, particular uh, slides that would be helpful. So a request for the plant this, not that sheet that Kathy and Barry shared um, and the Audubon link for certification. There's a question about um, from Aisha about um, ensuring safety of identifying homes and people who may not want to be identified. So um, the the um, survey link that we sent around. So you you don't have to include your address if you don't want to, and if you feel more comfortable um, just not filling anything out, you could reach out to one of the organizers, and we'd be happy to figure out what makes you comfortable in that sort of scenario. Um, so it would be at your discretion, how you'd want to share any sort of information. If, I think, if, hopefully that's helpful. I think she, the, the, the question may have also been referring to the map that Luke was showing. If somebody didn't want to be on that map, yes. um, they would not be obligated to be on the on your uh, native plant no. network border map, I wouldn't think. Is that correct? No, not at all. Yeah. yeah. Not at all. Totally voluntary. Yeah. It's a, it's a really good question. It's something we've also thought about. A, a bit. There was also a question about um, code enforcement and natives kind of encroaching on sidewalks and kind of what um, neighbors need to know about that and um, whether there are conversations with code enforcement. That's that's a great question. Um, I proposed changes to the code that were adopted in December that should make it so that if you have a native habitat on your yard, that's not against the law. And if you become a member of the native plant network, 
and you want to share your address with the city, um, you, there would be a presumption that you are in compliance with the law. Um, so the way that the regulation is written is that there is no longer a prohibition on having uh, this, this type of habitat. And, and it could be, it's not just limited to native plant habitat, it could be a, just a pollinator garden or a vegetable garden, things of that nature. Yeah, and to add what Luke was saying, um, it's also important when it comes to the educational aspect, the more workshops like this we have, in it, even if this is placed like an MRTV, it allows for your neighbors to be able to learn what native plants are and what they look like. And I think that's, that's also said um, a lot of confusion on what is expected to look like. And I think that if they see what they are, what the plants are, they're more accustomed to know what is, what is a native plant and the purpose for it. So education across you know, the community also will help because a lot of the um, reports that are got, are the code receives are done via other neighbors. So if we start educating and now that it's part of the law, it also allows room for this to continue to grow and happen. I kind of wanted to jump in here if it's okay, just to echo Selena, because I think that's really, really important. And Barry talks a little bit about the idea of um, our responsibility, each of us, to make sure our property is clearly planful. The signs really help with that because they legitimize it. They say you're part of a plant network, you're connected to the Audubon Society, but also that idea of making sure that if you have floppy plants, they're not along the sidewalk and that um, you have clear paths and beds so that it's very, it, um, it, that there are these cues to people who pass by or to your neighbors that this is not an unkempt weed patch. It is a planned, legitimate, careful, useful, valuable to the community garden. Um, and, and, and as Selena said, that's also how we educate each other. Thanks, Kathy. I see another one um, in reference to kind of the birds that you started with. Have we lost certain birds that we would anticipate returning to our area should we increase our native uh, network? I guess I can take a crack at that, um, although I'm a very, very um, beginning birder, um, a backyard birder. Um, but the hope is, and I, there is some evidence, in fact, um, one of the studies that Tommy did was in DC, and it was a study of chickadee breeding. Um, and what they discovered was that chickadees would not um, make their nests and go through the whole breeding process unless a property, an area had 70% natives. So there's a clear correlation between the success of um, bird propagation at least and um, a native habitat. And just speaking from our experience, um, before we began to plant natives and I've been gardening in Mount Rainier for almost 30 years, but only um, recently in this way. And it used to be we only had English sparrows. Now we have all kinds of birds that we never saw before. So it clearly makes a difference. Great. Um, also in your presentation, I see Jackie has her hand raised. So maybe I'll go to Jackie next. A question from Thomas is, the rules for planting in public medians. So since that was a suggestion, maybe go to the um, uh, border area between the street and the sidewalk. What are the rules for planting in those areas? That's an, another great question. And Brian just wrote some legislation to update our regulations on that front. And you can have they can't block the public walkway, so they can't be hanging over the sidewalk or hanging over the curb. Um, and I think there is a link that they have to have between the curb um, and where your sort of native uh, landscape would start. And I think it has to be six inches so that if you open a car door, you could sort of kind of get out. I know six inches on top of the curb isn't a whole lot of space, but I think that's the way the legislation was wrote. Um, 
but that should be updated in our code pretty soon. I don't know how long it takes them to get our legislation from the time we sign it to when it's inputted into uh, the software that runs our code work. Selena, do you have anything to add there or is that, I think, capturing it? Yeah, that's pretty much what I remember. Yeah, Munico will like, they will input and it will automatically update. And also because we have our own uh, code, they should be able to um, gather information. The minute we pass it, it becomes law. They should be able to put it into place automatically. And the area you're talking about is the tree boxes. And so that's part of also your property. And then I think I saw Jackie raise a physical hand if you wanted to unmute. Yes, can, can you hear me or not hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Kathy, this was in relationship to what you said. Have you seen chickadees? Uh, not, yes, chickadees in your backyard. Have chickadees returned to the neighborhood? Does just, anybody just today, um, our neighbors texted us to say that there were chickadees in their oak tree, and then we saw them fly to our redbud in the back of the yard. So the answer is yes. Great. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I see another one about uh, recommendations for landscapers that might focus on native planting um, for their, their neighbors. And if there aren't any known ones, I'm sure we could add that to our resources and gather any um, information from neighbors. Um, let me say this. Um, there's an enormous market for this field <laughs> and very little available right now. <laughs> There's a, uh, I know of one uh, native plant uh, garden designer uh, who's in Howard County and it's Lauren's garden. And I think she would work down this far. She's the only one I know of, but we'll check further and see it. But if this, is, this is Kira. I just added into the chat um, for the Maryland Native Plant Society. Uh, because I, I was looking for not landscaper, but just resources, I added in the link. Um, and there is a page uh, for nurseries. And if you go through that, it talks about you can get seeds or you can get retail or you can, some are, are landscapers. Um, I was poking around the other day and I, I would encourage anyone um, to, to really look at the information and ask questions if you're reaching out to any kind of suppliers um, because they may not be as knowledgeable as you assume they are. <laughs> um, and, and this all, is all an education for, for many of us. Um, and so hopefully that MarylandFlora.org site, you know, it, it's the Maryland Native Plant Society. Hopefully it has good information, but um, I think it's worth always asking when you're you're going to people for guidance. Um, Thank you, Kira. Uh, Maryland Native Plant Society is a great resource. Um, the other thing I, I would say about it is that part of our network building, uh, part of our movement is convincing nurseries that carry mostly European and Asian plants that they should be carrying more native plants. The demand is here. We have to demand that the nurseries uh, carry these plants so that they're available for everybody to, to put in their gardens. Just keep talking to them, telling them about uh, how they'll sell their plants right out as soon as they put them in. Uh, they just might not know they need to be educated that the only good plants are not Asian and, uh, and European plants. And Judy also put in the chat about Great Blue, which um, I believe they do. Judy, maybe you could say something about that. Yeah, I just, truth truth in advertising, two of the uh, owners of Great Blue are my kids, and the third one is Steve and Mimi's son, David. They all grew up here in Mount Rainier. They uh, do tree work, but they also do native uh, garden installations. They have a landscape architect that works with them on design, and uh, ben has been uh, trained, has been taking courses on, you know, specifically on native um, habitats. And so they're, uh, I put their website in, it's kind of fun to look at it. 
they are small and so you know they have a lot of garden work this year which is great a lot of people are putting in native gardens and so they're real busy um, but you know they can schedule out into the fall and that kind of thing too but you know truth in advertising two of them are my kids but they did put a beautiful garden a native garden in my yard last summer I'm so thrilled with it so you're welcome to come see anytime <laughs> There was also recently a lot of chatter about the cicadas coming. And so I don't know if there's any um, information you might want to share to folks who have new gardens or new plants in terms of covering new trees. Um, I've certainly seen other programming on this specific topic as well, which I noticed um, some other folks um, included in the chat. Um, if I can j just really quickly say that my understanding is that um, although they're, it's going to be really weird and loud, um, it's, they're not really destructive except to young trees that are um, not well established and are big enough so that a female cicada can cut a slit and put her eggs in the branch um, where they then hatch and drop to the ground. So if you have a very small tree that has, you know, really thin branches, the cicada is not going to be interested in that because it won't work. But if you have a mid-sized tree or a shrub that has branches that are, you know, kind of not too complicated and, and big enough for the cicada to use, those you might want to cover with netting. Trees that are big and established, the cicadas will use them, but they won't really harm them because those trees have, you know, enough growth behind them and they're stable enough that they, they don't get bothered. So they're really more bother to us um, than to our plants. We also had a question a little bit ago about what is a good medium sized tree for a front yard. I think that many of us in Mount Rainier have smaller yards and planting really large trees um, close to the house creates some problems. So um, if there are any recommendations around the call for smaller trees. Yeah, good question. Uh -huh. uh, and you see some of them out in the street boxes uh, that the Tree Commission has been planting under the utility uh, lines. Um, so that's a good guide right there. That tells you that's as tall as that tree is gonna get. Uh, some of those are um, uh, service berries, uh, red buds, uh, hornbeams, uh, sweet bay magnolia, uh, hackberry, uh, and hawthorn, another good medium-sized tree. Uh, dogwoods are really beautiful and some people have had success with them but many others have not. So if you're willing to take the risk of losing a dogwood or maybe more than one, even till you get one established, dogwood is a, a really nice choice, but just be forewarned that, it, that we lose a lot of them. I was gonna mention- Oh, sorry, Dave, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna mention one of the things that we're gonna before and we'll folks who are interested once you sign up we'll have your information i think we'll probably have for the zoom we can send this around but um a way for uh the community to share photos and just sort of updates and ask questions sort of like we're doing in the chat right now um so we're thinking about for the time being using the matt rainier green team's facebook website is sort of a place to do that um so you know just to share what everyone's seeing in their yard and fun birds and wildlife and plants um, eventually, I guess if it's like really popular, maybe Sarah will move it some place of its own. Uh, don't want it to drown out all the other great work that y'all are doing. But so stay tuned for that, and it'll be great to see what folks are up to. And I don't see any additional questions in the chat right now, unless I missed one. Um, but if there are any on the call, feel free to unmute and ask your question. And I had one, if uh, there aren't any others. Um, so my question was, when uh, you see a, you know, a plant, a nursery, a plant that's marketed as a pollinator, 
um, what is the difference between a native pollinator and just an average pollinator? And what does that do? What is the benefit change, I guess, in planting a native versus planting um, any plant labeled a pollinator? Well, um, there are a lot of plants that are out there that say they're wonderful plants for pollinators. I'll give you an example, and that's the butterfly bush. The butterfly bush attracts many, many butterflies, but it provides no nutrition for butterflies. It's basically sugar, and that's what attracts them. And yet people get really excited, naturally, because they've gotten a lot of butterflies come to their garden. It also turns out it's invasive. It drops lots of seedlings all over your yard and your neighbor's yard. So it's not a good choice. Whereas something like the blueberry that we put up uh, on the screen uh, is host to 294 caterpillars and it provides berries for birds that they need to fatten up when they're migrating across the Gulf of Mexico. And when it's in flower, it also attracts moths and butterflies, but the pollen is such that it's very nutritious for them. And the bees are collecting them and spreading them from plant to plant and creating a community of those plants. So native plants are by far the best pollinators Although other plants will attract pollinators, they won't provide the nutrition for them. Barry, on a quick follow-up on that, would would native plants also support like additional life cycles of plants and bugs in, in a way that maybe a butterfly bush or something that's just a pollinator, or well, not really, but is, is that part of it too? I'm not certain I understand your question, but uh, okay. if, you're, if you're you're talking about the the health uh, and nutrition that that's provided by the flowers. So the native plants have co-evolved with butterflies and moths over many centuries. They're providing the best nutrition. And many of the butterflies, the other pollinators are specialists. There's one plant and only one plant that they get their nutrition from. There are some generalists, but many, many of the insects, the butterflies, the bees, that do the pollination, do it with one plant. So you've got hundreds of different species, let's say, of bees in your garden, and you need many, many species of plants, great plant diversity, in order to fulfill the needs for those pollinators. That just makes for a, a healthy environment to have lots of different plants and lots of different bugs all at work and providing benefit to the birds as well. Great, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, are there any other questions on the call? Hi, this is Judy. Thank you, all of you for doing this. I love this so much. Um, I love seeing this effort and I love all of the expertise that you're all willing to share. So just wanted to say thank you. Um, I had put in the chat, but I, I've, I've embarked on my native plants journey last year um, and I'm really excited to keep growing it, um, no pun intended. And I had learned, um, I was just started learning about cultivars and what that means. I know I went to Homestead Gardens last year and I, they had like a little, now that Venki is gone, um, and they had a little section that they said were native plants. Um, and so I got some and I was excited, but then I learned, oh, these are cultivars or they're maybe not native to here, or, you know, they're calling it native just because it's, it's from Arizona, you know, it's native to the United States. Um, and so I kind of fell into that pitfall with some of my purchases and fortunately didn't do any huge purchasing, but can someone just explain a little more like what the cultivar situation is um, and how do you not fall into that pitfall or is it, or does it really matter that much? Is it like, it's better to have that versus, versus, you know, the alternative like of invasive species from Asia? <laughs> I did it, you're unmuted. Okay, yeah, there, thanks Katie. There's, <laughs> there's a whole hierarchy to keep in mind. So to say one thing is terrible and another thing is, 
is, is good, uh, only goes so far, there's a continuum. The worst things you can have in your garden are invasive plants, mm -hmm. and those need to come out. Right? The next thing is introduced plants, plants from Europe and Asia. And to the extent that you can, those should be replaced by native plants. Although I'm as guilty as anyone, I have some non-native plants, plants from Europe and Asia that I'm attached to. And I keep in mind that 30% figure. I can still put in 70% natives and have my 30% non-natives that I'm attached to and I, I think they're beautiful. Uh, so going down through the hierarchy, uh, cultivars or nativars as they're sometimes called, would be the next best choice. Um, they oftentimes do the same thing that straight species uh, natives do, but depending on how much they've been hybridized, how much they've been altered, they may provide no benefit. Um, some, uh, the, the biggest information, best information I've gotten is particularly on colored leaves, like um, uh, purple uh, pansy red buds, where the insects haven't co-evolved with the chemistry that's in those red buds. They know green leaf and they don't know purple leaf and they don't tend to use them. Uh, or double flowers, let's say, you know, quadruple uh, echinacea uh, that, uh, uh, that, that the, the bugs probably can't even get into because there's just so many petals that it's, you might call it a cultivated native plant, but it's of no benefit. So the next best are straight species, particularly local ecotype plants that are grown, that are up here, here in our woods and our meadows. Uh, and those are the best plants to have. And among those, the best are the ones that Doug Tallamy calls the keystone plants, or that Steve was referring to as uh, top 10 plants, the ones that provide uh, home for the most caterpillars and hence uh, provide the most benefit to, to birds. Thanks. Other questions? I think we have about four minutes left. <laughs> yes. All right, hearing nothing, Sarah, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. All right, well, um, thank you so much, um, everyone who attended. I hope this was informative. Um, we're going to be sending out some of the links from the chat, the link to the form to fill out to get more information on you know, the Data Plant Network um, and all of that after the call. Um, we did record this, so uh, we're going to upload it to the Green Team, I think we have the Green Team YouTube page, and I'll send out that link later as well. Um, I want to thank uh, especially uh, our speakers today. Um, Luke, Kathy, Barry, uh, Dave, thank you so much for sharing our expertise. And Kira and Olivia, thank you so much for um, all of your help with this as well. And um, again, we're very much looking forward to seeing all the native plants all over Mount Rainier. So uh, we're looking forward to the next steps. And um, I think that is that is it for us. Uh, any of our speakers have any, any last uh, any words of goodbye? Or just thank you. Just want to thank everybody for attending. Thanks for your interest in native plants. and. Uh... Let's keep the movement going. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night, everyone. Mm -hmm.